Hey, welcome everybody to uh, Vantage Point. Empathy boosts productivity sponsored by Vantage Circle. And today we're going to look at insights on how to enhance uh, leadership empathy as we enter this new post new normal COVID workplace. And our guests, and we're delighted to have so many wonderful people here today, are going to share just not ideas, but tools and techniques and explain how empathy can boost productivity and engagement and all that good stuff. And of course, with me as always is my dear friend, co-author and business partner, Adrian Gostick. Wave to the crowd, Adrian. <laughs> well, thanks, Jess. And thanks everybody for joining us, especially big thanks to our panel today. Um, I love it how in the introduction, it says we're going to hear from the best minds in HR and Adrian Tester. So uh, yeah. <laughs> we are the and. So, uh, <laughs> and we're thrilled to do, to, to present uh, the, this distinguished panel for us today. Hey, let me introduce who we, we have to share with some amazing thoughts. Uh, first up, we have Zenat Ladani, who is the HR leader and for the Global Oncology Business Unit at Daiichi Sankyo. Um, prior to that, she was Global Head of uh, Talent Acquisition and Strategy uh, for Bristol Myers Squibb. She spent her uh, career diving, uh, driving the overall development and execution of global talent strategies, delivering people and organizational solutions, and leading teams through global transformation. We also have Andy Holmes. Andy is a speaker, coach, and until recently was the global head of well-being at Reckitt. In his work, he takes a strategic approach to human cap uh, capacity, working throughout his career to restructure personal and organizational approaches to well-being, leadership, and performance. And we also have Susan Schmidt-Winchester, who is the Chief Human Resources Officer for Applied Materials. She spent 30 years creating value for organizations in a variety of industries and helping build corporate cultures where every individual can contribute their best. And she's also the author of the amazing new book, Healing at Work. So we want to welcome all of you to the, to the panel today. And thanks so much for, for taking some time with us. Hey, I want to start out by defining this idea of empathy and leadership and why it's important in the workplace today. And Z, we're going to start with you, if you don't mind. Um, and then we're just going to go around our, our panel and, and share some ideas. So give us an idea. What is this idea? And as you work with your leaders at, at DSI, how do you help them understand that this, um, this idea really is important? Absolutely. First of, first of all, thank you so much, Hester and Adrian, for inviting me to the panel. And so excited, honestly, to be here and participating in the panel with Susan and Andy. Um, I think empathy is a very, very strong concept. And I think up until recently, now in COVID, I think we, we have a very different perspective of empathy than we have had previously. Um, empathy is all about understanding whatever employees are feeling and what they are probably going through, right, in, in their work lives, maybe probably non-work lives. Um, empathy in leadership is extremely critical. Um Empathetic leaders, what we've noticed is empathetic leaders tend to be really, really good at recognizing cues, recognizing people's feelings, thoughts, uh, both what has been uh, the, the verbal as well as the nonverbal communication, right? They're extremely good at that. Um, these leaders are really good. If, if they're good at empathy, they're, it's really good that they, the empathy can really help them build trust. Um, with their teams, there are so many benefits of empathetic leaders because it helps with um, innovation, it helps with problem solving, it helps with building collaboration. Um, it also honestly helps with uh, with making sure that we have a very inclusive culture, right? When you when you start thinking about empathy and leading with that empathy, um, the world that we live in today. I tell people is very, very different. Um, it's no longer that nine to five when you leave work, you're done with work. It's not like your work, you, you can't no longer walk in and out of work, right? What happens while you're working impacts your non-work life. What happens when you're not working, right, impacts your work life. So it's really important and it's critical for leaders to be empathetic today. So Andy, you're gonna you're gonna challenge something there. I could just see the wheel spinning in your mind that uh, <laughs> there, there's something going on there. Because I, mean, no, no, I mean, I'm in a very uh, you know sort of relaxed mood today, oh, so I'm, I'm going to take things easy. No, I, I think you know, I I uh, 
I think um, everything Z says um, holds a huge amount of weight. Um, I think as I was listening there, you know, the sort of the cogs in my brain were turning, and that's probably the look you could see, uh, Adrian. But I think one of the things with with business at the moment is business is very busy. Um, you know, the, the topic is how does empathy boost productivity? I think if you strip that back and say, well, what damages productivity is inefficiency. And for me, inefficiency comes from businesses, people, leaders, organizations chasing and trying to react to symptoms, trying to react to the things that they see or the things that they hear. And when you think about empathy, as, as Z has already outlined, empathy happens way, way before something that someone says. Empathy is the ability to feel what someone else feels. It's not language. It's not behavior. It's the ability to perceive on a level deeper than that. So what empathy gives you is the ability to almost tap into the source rather than the impact or the collateral or the, or the, the sort of the, uh, the sort of the existential piece of that. So if someone comes to work and they say something, then people will typically react to what they say based on their own bias and their own lens and their own narratives and phraseology. If someone comes and they behave in a certain way, people will, leaders will interpret that behavior based on other behaviors or what's appropriate or not, or what's consistent with the leadership values or whatever it might be. If a leader can feel what someone else feels, that happens way before the reactive symptoms and things. So it allows leaders to actually really get the data from raw from the source. Um, the other thing it does is it means that individuals who are being supported by that leader don't have to worry about what they say or what they do. They can rely on the fact that that leader will be able to perceive how they feel. And that's really, really important because it's about as close as we get to the uniqueness that makes us human beings. You know, there aren't a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of other people or a lot of other species kicking around who can do this. But, you know, empathy is incredibly important. It allows us to tap into the source. And that's really important when you've got a busy organization with lots of things flying around that everyone's trying to fix. Well, and that, that leads me to Susan, too, because, Susan, you're not exactly working with, you know, it's not, you're not a Disney where everybody's imagining. You're working with applied materials. This is a really, you know, this is an engineering-driven organization. How do you get leaders to understand the importance of this topic when, when you're in a very, uh, you know, very structured organization like yours? Well, that is a really good question, and I love what Z and Andy both had to say, because when I think about empathetic leaders, there's a... You know, I think, Andy, you said this, there's a step before becoming empathetic, which is you have to be consciously aware of what's happening for other people. And I think in a lot of companies, certainly in the semiconductor industry, which is where I am, the intensity of what's happening in our businesses with all the challenges, with supply chain challenges, with the pandemic and ongoing questions about what the future of work look like. What I've noticed is that with the intense intensity of things that are happening in, I think, many companies, not just at Applied Materials, it, it's harder for leaders to be aware of what's going on for the other people because there's so much pressure. There's less time to do everything. Customers have great demands. Our key objective is to meet those demands. And so I think, you know, the, the challenge is how do you navigate the, the regular demands of a company but then also do it realizing that when you are empathetic, when you are able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and really feel what they're feeling, it will actually accelerate performance in the team. When we don't do that, and this has been a key focus for us at our company, when we aren't doing that, people are going to decide if they're going to stay at the company. Right. You know, so if they're feeling like things are moving too fast and people, their managers aren't paying attention to them because they're so busy, they're so stressed, they have so many pressures on them. When people feel like they don't matter or that they're not being heard or seen, that's when we risk disengagement and we when we risk people actually deciding to leave. So the way we're, we're working on this is we're doing a lot of discussion on how important the, the people equation is. You know, obviously, our whole company is an engineering technology company. We're in an incredibly complex industry. And we can't always just focus on the technology and the business. We have to focus in on our organization, our culture, our talent strategy. And I'm very proud to say that's exactly what we're doing. You know, that begs the question, you know, so you say, look, we have all these benefits, you know, retention, engagement, and how do you teach leaders how to do that? You know, because so many leaders are saying, hey, look, um, I get stuff done. 
you know, you want to check the boxes. I, I get stuff done. All this touchy feely stuff. I'm not so sure. So, so Susan, right, right back to you, you said you're, you're doing some various things. How do you, first off, how do you get leaders to buy in that leading with empathy really matters? And then how do you teach somebody to feel that way when they just really don't think that's part of their DNA? Uh, yes, that is an excellent question. Also, uh, Chester. <laughs> so, you know, when I think about how do we do it and, and why is it important? You know, engineers love data, so we use a lot of data. And we all know that, you know, when people feel more engaged, you know, their experience and what they're willing to give to a company dramatically increases. So we use a lot of data to share the importance of the, the, the people equation. And please don't misunderstand. We have a lot of great people managers at our company. It's how do you take that and, and replicate it and really accelerate it? And so some of the things that we're doing um, in our company to, to help enable that, uh, one thing that we're doing is we've introduced in our teaching through training programs what we call how to execute a state interview. Um, a state interview is really um, something you should be doing rather than waiting to an exit interview. A state interview is designed to talk to people, a series of questions, things like what frustrates you the most about working here? Uh, if you had a magic wand, what would you change? To, uh, t what one thing would you change about either the company or your job? Uh, questions like if a headhunter called you tomorrow, what would it take for you to call that person back? As well as questions about how they're feeling on their career track. And so it's a one on one conversation between a manager and an employee, or it could be a skip level. Could You could have a manager once removed doing that discussion also. So we've been doing trainings like that. And we're also doing. Um, Trainings around career conversations, because we know that people care a lot about their careers. It's the number one reason people typically leave is they perceive greater career advancement and development somewhere else. So we're taking time sitting down with all of our people managers. We did a global people manager forum on Monday uh, with you know over 1,400 people managers talking about what we're going to do to support them in career conversations is a key component of that. So I think there are a couple of pieces. HR's responsibility is how do we provide tools to help leverage the, the desire to have a more empathetic workplace and then spending a lot of time in training and conversations with our managers. That's amazing. 1,400 managers. You know, Adrian and I have enough trouble just Managing three people on a panel. I can't imagine a conversation. <laughs> well, and that, I mean, that's just a, that's a percentage of our global uh, people management organization. But we're making that video of the, of the entire session available to all of our global people managers. And so it, it, is, um, it is an area of opportunity for us to do even more to support our people managers and recognizing what and how they can take action to really engage their, their people. Oh, that's great. So Z, and we, we were laughing before. I mean, what, what a cool like moniker. I'm, I'm Z, you know, it's like Sting, which is a, a great brand. Um, so how, how do you break through? How do you get managers to buy into this whole empathy thing? What have you done that's, that's been successful? You know, I think that's a great question. I think Susan said a lot of it, right? I, I think the role of HR is to help support the managers and the leaders to really help achieve our business objectives, goals and objectives. And the way to do it is inspiring and engaging workforce, right? And so there's quite a lot we have done around helping leaders build their own soft skills. Because, you know, just because somebody is hired in as a leader doesn't mean they're perfect and they've got all the soft skills. And the first time you actually ask a leader, so many times what we do is, when we kick off people manager forums or we have something called people strategy forums where you've got, you know, 100 people throughout the organization at different levels from different departments. Every time we actually roll out an initiative or we're considering um, putting in a policy, right, when we actually came back to after a year and a half of working virtually, when we actually came back to the office or we're considering what would that look like, we not only reached out to our people manager forum, our top 100 leaders in the organization, but our people strategy champions to say, help us think through this, right? What are we, what, what should we be thinking about it as an organization? What should we not be thinking about as an organization? How would you do it differently? Let's brainstorm together. What it does, it, it helps us understand the pulse of the organization 
but you, because you've got these hundred people throughout the organization representing their departments and their functions. But when we when we finally get to a solution, right? These are ambassadors that are helping us implement those solutions mm-hmm. and, and are really spokespeople, non-HR spokespeople. And so I think that's really, really helpful. What we've also done with our managers is to help them understand the power of having consistent one-on-ones, right? Many times people, we've seen in organizations or different functions, um, people usually use meeting times, normal meeting times, and, and five minutes, you know, five minutes of that meeting in the end to catch up with their um, with their employees. Um, but it has shown that those those one-on-ones are extremely critical to have a very open dialogue and to build that relationship that is not always about what's going on at work, what projects are you working on. It's also about like, where can I help you prioritize? Where can I help you remove barriers as a manager, right? What would you, where can I help you grow and develop, whether it's getting exposure to certain topics or certain projects, certain initiatives, what, what are your career aspirations, right? So I think it's really important to help managers recognize where to spend their time, right? And, and why it's so important to spending their time with their, with their teams or with their employees one-on-one. Um, we've also uh, done a lot of sessions around helping leaders recognize how to pay attention to early signs of burnout, Right. Because that's really critical. We're really seeing a lot of burnout today, um, a lot of stress. And a lot of it is because of either lack of prioritization or it's just way too much going on. So it's we've we've been working with leaders to say, how can you spot it early? So we're proactive about the conversations around stress and burnout. Um, We're also considering as employees, giving giving employees an opportunity to give feedback, right, in an open forum. And and when people do that, when employees do that, really giving them the positive reinforcement so that more and more employees feel comfortable. Um, We're trying to create a psychological safety environment where people actually feel safe to say, I can voice my opinion. I can voice what's on my mind without, without, the fear of, of this is well, this will come back to me, right? So it, it's unfortunately unfor- or unfortunately, some leaders are great at it. Some really need the help and hand holding, and that's where I think the role of HR really comes in. Excellent. Yeah, that one on one time really does make a difference, doesn't it? It really does. You know, I, I'm always impressed when we have these conversations, and, and Andy, I want you to have the last word on this one, but that there's a leadership discipline around empathy as well, isn't there? I mean, you just can't say, be more empathetic and we're going to create these stuff. Mm -hmm. There has to be that follow through from the leader as well, right? They have that discipline to set up those one-on-ones. So what what, what have you seen that's successful in getting people to buy into that discipline? I think, um, you know, for me, I've, you know, I've had the the benefit of obviously Reckit. We've got, you know, we have 50,000 people across a lot of markets. Um, We... Our well-being program is very, very different to a lot of well-being programs. Um, we're a performance organization, and our agenda was basically, you know, if we want well-being to thrive and live in Racket, then it needs to be unapologetically orientated to performance. Um, you can't have a performance organization doing something that's going to be perceived to limit performance. Um, so we actually led really heavily into diving into things like cognitive anthropology, looking at the neuroscience, looking at the biological data um, to see what it was telling us. Um, one of my sort of big beliefs is that I believe that we can do more than we'd ever anticipated by being more than we'd ever appreciated. Do more than we'd ever anticipated by being more than we'd ever appreciated. Now, why does that statement matter? Well, the first part of that statement is what every organization on the planet wants from their people. The second part of that statement is what every individual wants from their organization. Appreciate me. Okay, so we started off with that. And if you look at something like empathy, we're all wired biologically to be empathetic. It's not something that's alien to us as a human race. We are wired to be that way. It's in our biology. The challenge is that to be empathetic, you need to be well resourced from a personal perspective so that you're not in threat mode. But you also need to create space and time. So for our leaders, it wasn't so much how do we get them to buy into it. It was how can we create an environment where they can experience it 
to really understand and appreciate the value of it. Um, so one of the things we did around that was we looked at what was causing us not to be empathetic. And one of the reasons that people are not empathetic is because they're stressed. They have fluctuating moods. They have high stress levels. So we did a project with uh, Garmin. Um, we looked at the first bit diagnostics and we measured stress and recovery um, as we went through the day. So we got a whole um, human resources uh, lead team. We all wore ECGs and we looked at the stress and recovery trace over the course of a week. We then overlaid that over a Microsoft Outlook calendar so we could see what type of meetings, what type of people were causing stress versus recovery. Then we started to say, well, how can we create more recovery elements so that people are better resourced, so that people's natural intent, intent to be empathetic can come through? One of the things we saw was that small pulses like walk and talk meetings on a phone, not, not, not Zoom, just on a phone with earpods in, that had a really restorative effect. And it only needed to be 10 minutes, but it allowed us to start to oscillate. And when you look at human biology, we're wired to oscillate. If we oscillate, we can be empathetic. Um, so in doing that, we created an environment where leaders experienced empathy, but they also demonstrated empathy because empathy is not a behavior that you train or teach. Empathy is something that's intrinsic. It's, it's, it's in our wiring. So for us, it was not about how do we train people to behave in a way that's contrary to how they feel. It was more about how do we create an environment where they feel that they want to be empathetic. And when we saw that, what we started to see was that people felt what other people felt. We started to see more psychological safety. We saw great levels of hope and optimism. As a result, we saw more inclusion. We saw higher levels of collaboration and innovation because all of a sudden you've created an environment where people feel supported. And when you feel supported, your behavior becomes very different to when you feel threatened. So, so that was our big thing. The science gave us the cues and the data to actually look at it and say, we're trying to get people to behave in a way that's not how they feel. And that's the crux. You know, if you ask someone to be kind to someone that they're frustrated with, it's very difficult. If you create an environment where they're not frustrated with someone, but they appreciate someone, it's very much, it's much, much easier to be empathetic and indeed, indeed kind. Well, and this leads us, and it's a great uh, point you're bringing up, Andy, because you're leading us into um, one of the ideas about metrics around this, because, you know, people who are listening in, if you're in HR, you're wondering, this all makes sense. I, I buy in, I believe, but how do I prove this to my senior leaders that we need to do this? And as you're saying, you found metrics that were important to you. Um, if somebody's getting started here, and, and Z and Susan, in a minute, I want to talk to you about your metrics and where you're measuring. But Andy, if I'm getting started in this and I'm I'm in HR, where do I begin measuring? Do I have to find what's important to me in, in our firm or, or are there some universal metrics that we could look at? Well, I think one of the things that, um, you know, that, that we really had to kind of cut through, and this isn't, you know, um, solely Racket. This is across other organizations I've been working with in the past sort of four or five months. but one of the things that I've seen, which most organizations have data around, most organizations have engagement score data. The challenge is that most engagement surveys are written by the organization. So by default, there is bias in the questions, and the questions are biased to tell the organization what they'd like to hear, not what they really need to hear. Um, but one of the things that, that we started to do is we started to run what we call a sentiment analysis on the engagement surveys. So most of the engagement surveys have, have a facility where as, well, as much as the the absolute numbers and the metrics and the percentages, you can run a sentiment analysis, which will give you commentary around certain phrases, terms, words used throughout the entire survey. And what we saw was that when asked directly about things like well-being or burnout, people didn't typically respond by saying, I'm burnt out because of the company or my well-being struggling because of the way we operate. Because that requires someone to be incredibly psychologically safe and trusting in the integrity of the survey. What we did see happen, and I've seen this across multiple organizations, is that people reference that commentary to other questions because it's less, in, it's less direct, it's less confronting, but it allows them to get their message out there. And when I've worked with other organizations, we've seen as much as tenfold increases on things like burnout, psychological safety, and issues associated with it. So in terms of a start of 10, my urge would be don't take the data for what the data says. <clears throat> Build the insights around the data. So try and mine it. See what people are saying indirectly about your organization, about the culture. And that will give you a bit of a cue 
as to where some of the challenges are coming from. If people, you know, so so we hear things like people are feeling very compromised or um, don't feel that they're able to say no um, to meetings, to, to the cadence of the organization, that kind of thing. If that's your challenge, then don't train people how to behave against it and try and break the system. Take a step. Oops. Uh-oh. Andy, you, you, muted. You, you muted yourself inadvertently there, Andy. Andy. Here we go. We Sorry go. about that. I don't know how that happened. I went on to mute without even touching anything. It was, you're, you're summarizing. We were, we're excited for it. Yeah. That's Can you hear me okay? yeah. 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 You're back. You're great. You're back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't. Sorry, I can't hear you. Let oh, me let me see if I can do okay. something on this end. We'll move on. But yeah, finish. Uh, yeah, try and get back with us. Um, and uh, and I love what Andy was saying that sometimes you measure uh, these things by not going directly at it, and you're seeing how it's being uh, measured in other areas. So, please uh, help us out here. Understand that uh, applied materials, how your how your how the metrics work with this idea of empathy and wellness resilience. Uh, yeah, I, I have to respond to a couple things Andy said, though, because I actually disagree with him on something. <laughs> and, you know, Andy, you said that we're wired for empathy. And, uh, and actually, somebody in the comments put a question about, you know, how do you deal with company politics? And so I think, do we lose Andy? I see him. I think he'll be back. We're working okay. on his audio. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So I what I was thinking about his comment about we're wired to be empathetic. And then the question that came in on company politics, I started thinking about, you know, how, how we think about capability at our company. And, and it's based on a very cool model, but one of the elements of that model is called temperament. And essentially means we all have a nature. We all show up at work with pluses and minuses. We all have good days and bad days. Um, and when only temperament only becomes a real problem if it impairs your performance. And it could be you're too nice. That could be a problem depending on the role requirements. But as I was thinking about his comment about, you know, we're wired for empathy, I have worked a long time in the HR world and in many companies and many industries, and I believe that some people are definitely more wired for empathy than others. And so, you know, there are some people that are very task-oriented, and there are other people that are more people-oriented. And there's always a blend. You know, this isn't this. I'm not trying to stereotype anybody. Um, but I, I do have a lot of experience with leaders who are not naturally inclined to be empathetic. Yeah. And um, and so then, you know, how do you really how do you really not only get to the metrics, Adrian, that you just asked me about, yeah. but how do you actually get to behaviors that are more empathetic or at least more attuned to the people around you? Uh, in terms of how people are showing up. And I think one of the key ways to do that uh, is all around leadership accountability. So one of the things that we do at our company, we're doing more and more of is really helping leaders become more aware of how they're perceived. We use some pretty cool uh, assessment instruments to help create an understanding of sometimes how we see ourselves may be quite different than how other people see us. And then more importantly, designing development plans to help support people with their gaps. Because it's not uncommon to have super strong people who are incredibly gifted on the what they do, the value they create, and not so great on the how they do it. And, you know, so maybe Andy, deep, 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 deep down there somewhere in their wiring, there's a there's a little bit of empathy, uh, but it's much more challenging to create it. So then you have to create a culture where people are held accountable for behavior that's actually having a detrimental impact in the organization. And and I think we do that in a pretty productive way through assessment and through, you know, um, conversations to help them understand. And the reality is, is the world's changed. The world has completely changed. Employee expectations of their workplaces have changed. And as we become more employee centric, more so than ever before, some of the things that we used to do in the past or we'd overlook relative to some of the leadership behaviors that were absolutely as far from empathy or empathetic as you could imagine, um, get more attention in terms of, you know, we've got to we've got to make sure this person understands the impact that they're having and the effect on our culture and how that naturally affects some of our metrics around voluntary turnover, voluntary turnover of regrettable losses, employee engagement. We do the sentiment analysis. I completely agree with Andrew's point on that. Uh, and, you know, there. I mean, we have a, a number of other metrics we track. 
But you know, think about this concept of company politics, which was really a perceptive question that someone asked. Temperament affects how people show up in the workplace. And so if your temperament is extremely competitive or extremely oppositional or extremely rigid or extremely avoidant, you end up with all these behaviors. And, and I think, Andy, you might have mentioned this earlier, that, that we do things that we don't even consciously realize are having the negative effect on people that they are. And and therefore, I think one of the first things we have to do as leaders is we have to learn how to be empathetic with ourselves mm-hmm. before we can be empathetic with our teams. And so the the complication around that is that two-thirds of us, the research shows, CDC research and Kaiser Permanente, the two-thirds of us came from some kind of a dysfunctional past that affects us in the workplace. So when we're triggered, when we're feeling our limiting beliefs kind of on fire and we're having these strong emotional reactions, that can affect how people experience the corporate culture or the effect of corporate politics, if you will. And so I think you do have to create some other ways. I, I love, Andy, what you were talking about in terms of creating cultures where people feel empathy so they desire to be more empathetic. I'm really mm. curious. I wish we could talk more about that. But I'm also talking about the reality of some of the challenges. And then you do have to sometimes be pretty tough on holding people accountable when they're doing something that's hurting the culture. No, I, I would, sorry, if, if I could just jump on the back of that, um, uh, Adrian, because I think as you were talking there, Susan, one of the things that, you know, we see as well is as the, the sort of the, the state of work and the, 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 the requirements of work and roles are changing and the industries and the way that we're functioning is changing so rapidly, a lot of people are finding themselves out of their depth. Um, so we've got a lot of people who are almost becoming disassociated from themselves because they are behaving in a way that is more like the avatar that they have envisaged in their mind that will lead them to success. Right. Um, and when people do that, their self-awareness kind of goes off a cliff. And when someone is really, really, you know, lacking self-awareness, they, they, there's no way they're going to be able to, you know, sort of display any sort of empathy because they can't identify with themselves to start off with, which I think speaks a lot to what you were just saying. Completely agree. Completely agree. And, I, and yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry, yeah, it's isn't. I'm yeah. just going to say that, you know, we all use different coping mechanisms to keep ourselves safe or at least a perception of safety. And some of those coping mechanisms are really negative in the workplace. You know, bullies, we, we've all worked in workplaces where there were bullies. I've worked in workplaces where people become invisible, so they hide so that no one sees them. Uh, you know, there's just a whole host of different um, unproductive, adapted uh, responses to how we're responding to our own issues. So I think a lot of what we have to do as leaders and as companies is find ways to create uh, a safe environment to talk and be open. You know, so I just did a session this week. I was invited to speak to one of our teams, about 100 people from around the world. And I talked about some of the concepts of understanding how much our past a dysfunctional past can actually unconsciously affect us in really negative ways and hurt our relationships, create some of those corporate politics dynamics that we've all lived with, and learning how to become much more conscious of old patterns, outdated scripts, outdated limiting beliefs that we have about ourselves so that we can do exactly what we're talking about and can be more present to be empathetic with others and not so stuck in our protective shells and our protective behaviors that keep us separate from people. Now, I love this discussion. I love the the debate too. Are we are we born with this or can we develop it? And uh, yeah, and you know, Chester and I we do a lot of executive coaching, usually with very technical managers. And I was doing three sixties this morning with a manager who I've worked with for a couple of years, and every single person who works for him says he needs to improve his his touchy feely side, if you will. Yeah. And every time I bring that to him, he says, Adrian, he says, I'm just not going to do it. I just oh. don't care. I don't and, know. <laughs> How do you get through that? And so what we've done is bring very specific things that he can do. He can do that. I can be more grateful. I can, do, But I'm not going to try to be more empathetic. But if you give him things to do, he will do it. So, so Z, again, very technical organization you're working with. How do you measure this? What are the metrics that you bring to the table? Thank you. I think some of it has already been said, right? I think one of the biggest um, metric is honestly engagement surveys. And, and it's... I think both Susan and Andy said this, right? It's not about, it is it is important what you're measuring, right? But it's more important to understand the insights that are coming out of it. So the happiness factor of 
would you recommend this is this is a great place to work, right? Um, you know, how would you rate your manager? Um, what is, you know, is this a place where you could develop your career, right? There's so many different ways of getting to to this, to the to the right engagement questions. And, and you know, um, we not only look at the engagement questions um, we or the answer, sorry, we look at exactly what you were saying, Andy. It's like how many times a certain word has been actually shared in the comments, whether it was or another question, right? So we do a word cloud. We look at the comments. We look at the total picture of what's coming out of the engagement score. But I think what's more powerful, honestly, is recognizing and talking about taking the insights that's coming out of the engagement survey and talking about it as an organization at the organization level, at the at the functional level, at the team level, in a very confidential manner, right? So um, talking about what are our opportunities? What, what are our employees actually saying? What do we do well as an organization? What are our areas of opportunities? And not hiding behind what we're not actually good at. So I think there's a lot of power in gaining credibility and trust when you're actually able to share those insights with your employees and then partner with them to say, hey, here are our top five opportunities. And it came from all of you guys. So how do we solve for this, right? Not being the person as a leader to say, I'm going to go solve for this, or I don't understand why, you know, we rated so low in these five areas of opportunities, but really recognizing, hey, this is this is where we're, these are things what we're doing well. Would you agree? These are things you guys have said our opportunities are. Let's now work together to address how do we change these from things that are not working well to maybe things that will we will start working better towards or this will end up becoming our our successes in the future, right? And so we have given a lot of tools and resources to the managers and the leaders and 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 really are even at our CEO level to be able to do this and to be able to do this so that it's not it's not recognized or it's not looked at as an HR project, right? It's looked at as the leader is leading it. Um, HR is absolutely there to support it, to run the surveys, to give the insights, to use an external firm so that we're really conscious about what we're asking and how we're asking. Um, But it's letting the leader lead it and be in front of it and own those results and, and the impact of it. You know, Z, you bring up a really interesting uh, point here because we say, you know, w- what else are people doing to, to boost EQ and and bring more empathy? How important is it that you make sure that the leaders are modeling that behavior? And, and to your point that it's not seen as another HR initiative. It's a leadership initiative. And then if I could tag on to that, just going off script a little bit, mm-hmm. are you seeing a generational difference as well? So getting the leaders involved, how, how important is that? And then are you seeing sort of this generational shift as well? Where- and by the way, I've seen Z work with her CEO and they work in tandem. You know, they are, they are, it's a strong partnership. And so I love HR and, uh, and the C-suite working, well, you know, she's part of the C-suite, but the CEO working that closely together. So, yeah. That's a great question. I think Chester, it is, it is extremely important I think that many times when things are HR led, right, people don't normally take it seriously. Or if people say, oh, this is an HR initiative, it's really not going to go anywhere, right? (laughs) When you start making leaders, when you start giving leaders a voice into key decision making of of policies, of, you know, what's going to change our outlook as an organization, um, you know, they get to shape the culture. So they feel that onus and that responsibility that, you know what, I need to do this for my employees. I think it's really important um, as leaders, right? So I think many times I was just speaking to a colleague about this just two days ago. We tend to actually use our leaders quite a bit in terms of our partner with our leaders, use is not the right word, but partner with our leaders Every time we open a forum and you get, you know, you want the leader to actually talk about it. And where I've seen a shift is many times it doesn't come naturally. That topic, whether it's empathy, whether it's like, hey, we're coming back to work, right? What does this mean? How do we reset our work, you know, um, work experience um, or or many other topics? um, The leader talks about it the first time because they've been asked to talk about it. Right. 
But where I've seen a huge difference is if that leader actually takes that and internalizes that topic and then starts talking about it in different forums with different leadership teams at different, you've not asked them to actually do that. So when they have, you've asked them to actually do it the first time at an all employee meeting or a town hall meeting, where I think I'm actually seeing a big difference is when they're reflecting on it, they're owning it and they're actually taking it to the, to, to way beyond what, what HR has actually asked them to do. So it's really the growth and development that that leader is going through as well, the more that they've reflected on that topic. So that's really, really important. Um, and I think, you know, that's something, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I, I do think there is also, I will say there is a, um, there is a generational differences in how we actually look at it for sure. Um, but, you know, I, I have not looked at, I think sometimes it's much easier um, to coach leaders. Uh, sometimes it's harder. I, I can't say with a certain amount of certainty that, you know, somebody who's a baby boomer, you know, is different than a Gen X or a Gen Y. Um, I think there is, uh, there is opportunity, I think, for all of us to be more empathetic. Excellent. So, so Andy, as you're hearing that discussion, I mean, you, you've coached a lot of leaders. Uh, I, I love what Z said. Look, you know, they'll do it the first time because you asked them to do it. <laughs> how, how do you get them to continue to exhibit that behavior and, and to model it for others? Does that resonate with I mean, you too? I think it's uh, it's a very difficult space at the moment. Uh, and it, this, I'm going to answer this one a bit kind of back to front, because I think if you look at generations 10 years ago, generations were 10 years apart. Now generations are probably five or six years apart. Um, and why does that matter? Well, that matters because the circles of influence have changed. The, the, the sort of the pathways aren't as well trodden. Um, they're not straight up and down. And I think one of the things that, you know, I'm very conscious of in this space is that there's an awful lot of being asked of leaders right now, an awful lot being asked of leaders, leaders who are compromised and struggling themselves. Yet the majority of initiatives, um, you know, corporate change, um, you know, sort of um, factors are all pushed on the leader and they all have to be demonstrating it's all top down. Um, and it's become a bit kind of vanilla and people are a little bit skeptical. Because let's be honest, most organizations have launched stuff through the leadership team. There's the usual cascade. Everything follows the same pattern. And it lasts until the next initiative comes and then something else is priority. Um, so one of the things that we did, we did it through well-being. We've done it through, you know, our kind of high performance network. And it's something that I'm working with other organizations around is instead of us trying to sort of get organizations to follow the traditional kind of corporate cascade, it's actually looking to the outside world and embracing a bit of the way that people communicate in normal life these days. Where do they take their influence from? Who are the influencers? Who actually drives the traction, the accountability, the longevity of these things? And a lot of the time, it's not metrics. A lot of the time, it's circles of influence. It's mini tribes. It's, you know, it, it's people who have equity in the business or people who have equity in those circles. So one of the things that you know I'm very conscious of is that when we do things like this, anyone can do this. Anyone can be the leader. It doesn't have to be hierarchical. It doesn't have to be someone who's got direct line reports. So that would be the first piece. Um, the second piece about the longevity of it is that the longevity is about what I call the millisecond lessons. It's the stuff that happens on the WhatsApp chat at the side of the virtual meeting that's happening. It's not what's said on a stage or on a slide deck or what they're no, no, what the CRHRO or the CEO or whoever stands up and says, it's the meeting after they've said that where they behave in a different way. That's what dictates the longevity of these sort of things. So for me, it's about coherence. So when we look at this, it's not about what do we measure, what do we do? It's about what is, you know, and it will be different for every organization. What makes things coherent in your organization? When we come to things like empathy, the danger is that it is so close to what our wiring as human beings human beings, that congruence and coherence are absolutely critical. So one of the things that's happened certainly second half of the pandemic is we've had a lot of initiatives, a lot of statements, a lot of purpose-driven stuff, which has raised expectation of the workforces. And what we're doing is we're failing to deliver the experience to match that day on day on day on day. And what that's created is skepticism, disbelief, um, cynicism, if you like. So what I would be encouraging people to do is don't look to the leaders the whole time. Look to the influencers. They're quite often different people. And the second thing is, what are the small millisecond lessons 
that build that robustness, that coherence, the congruence, the believability that will then get people to adopt and adapt it for themselves on a day-to-day basis. And quite often, it's not driven by corporate metrics. It's not about reporting. It's about feedback. It's about backdoor conversations. And it's about listening to the, the pulse of your organization in a different way. You know, it's interesting because Heather, in the comment and the question said, how do you communicate through technology where a lot of younger people are expecting you know, to, to, to utilize that more? And you've kind of answered that question. What's going on in the WhatsApp chat? What's going well, it, on? It could be, like, a lot of the time, this is on a virtual world, this is emojis. You know, we, we don't even think about it when people you're on, you know, you're on teams and people are sending hearts up or applauses or that kind of thing. And we don't report on it. But that's how people are showing. That's what that's only the only way people know how to convey that. It's the small conversations where someone sends each other a side message. And so often we're cynical if somebody looks down at the desk when they're on a Zoom call and we say, hey, get off your phone. We like everyone to be present <laughs> devices down. What happens yeah. if that person is sending, so I've done it, I've sent someone a message saying, hey, you okay? And yeah. that stuff really matters. So I think sometimes in our in our intent to try and control and manage, we actually undermine some of the things which are organic things that are people trying to be empathetic with each other. Excellent. So, Susan, what would you add to what's already been said? Say that again. Sorry, or Chester. What would you add to what's already been said? Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm just enthralled listening to both of the co-panelists on this session. Uh, one thing I would add in terms of, you know, how do you create more empathetic leaders is make sure that when you're hiring people, that's a criteria. I think that's one thing that wasn't mentioned. That's something we've incorporated into our, our you know, as we're looking for people, uh, an element of temperament is, is are they empathetic? Are they collaborative? Are they uh, somebody who's going to work across the organization and, and be able to work uh, in an effective way with other people. Uh, so that's one thing I would say. And so, you know, I mean, I just think this is such an important conversation because it absolutely affects the cultures within which we're working. And um, I'm also curious, either Andy or Z, if you're using actual training around empathy, how to be empathetic. And I'd love to hear if we, if we have time a little bit more about that. Absolutely. I think, Susan, you said it well. So first and foremost, we are actually using screening questions to screen for empathy because I think that's super critical, right, yep. um, in ensuring that you're hiring the right people and they're, they're matching kind of what the organizational values. Um, in terms of training, we're actually adding a lot of what we're doing is in our, our, a lot of our soft skills. We're, we're adding a lot of empathetic behaviors and, and values that are critical and will lead to empathy, right? And so that is something that we're doing as we're, um, so we have current trainings, but there's quite a lot that we're developing as well. So right now we're, we're touching probably our top leaders, but we are trying to do this day in, day out for our man, leaders of leaders, as well as our managers. Great. And then one other thing I have to completely agree with is that the approach we take is that it's leader-led and, and HR-enabled. And, you know, that it is absolutely a partnership. It's not HR pushing things out there. We work very closely with our key executives, our managers, our people to understand what it is that they most need, and then design different tools and programs and training to help support them. So I, I absolutely believe in being pulled to do things rather than pushing things. And, um, and it, it really is about creating a mentally healthy workplace. That's exactly what we're talking about. You know, this has been just such an amazing conversation. I see our time is up already. And so let's go around really quick. Everybody gets 30 seconds just to summarize last thoughts. And just then you can, you can have the last word. But uh, I'll start with you, Z. Last words on this. What, what, what are you taking away or what do you want people to take away today? I think there's a lot, I think, that has been said by the by the panelists, and I think that's amazing. But one thing I will say is, you know, many times leaders seem to think that they need to know everything. They need to have all the answers. And I think the power is actually in understanding that we don't have the answers, right? And our job as leaders is really to help facilitate who we're going to get to the solutions. And get the teams together to really come up with the solutions. Um, I read an article many, many years ago that, um, you know, what was the difference between 
And I think that that article highlighted was great leaders ask for help. Oh. And that's kind of stayed with me, right? There, there's a sense of authenticity there. There's a sense of vulnerability there. There's a sense of, I don't know all the answers, but I'm going to help us facilitate, I'm going to help facilitate and lead us and bring us together as a team where we can have diverse perspectives to get to the solutions and the answers. And I think that's extremely critical. Um, so, so those would be my departing kind of last words. Love it. Love it. Andy, your last thoughts. Um, this has been kind of provoked by Z and, you know, I think the, the phrase I would use is um, leaders don't need to know everything. They just need to feel something. <laughs> that's, that's a great you know, thing. You think about, you know, how often during the course of a day does a leader take a moment to think consciously about what they're feeling, yeah. not just reacting to the mood that they're subconsciously experiencing? So that would be the thing for me is, you know, you don't need to know everything, but we do want you to feel something. Love it. <laughs> Profound. And uh, Susan, the last word is yours. I think the first thing I would say is that our first responsibility is learning to be more empathetic and compassionate with ourselves. I think a lot of the lack of empathy originates where leaders aren't coming from a place of uh, their own self-compassion and own self-acceptance. And then secondly, I think it's important to note that empathy is about putting ourselves in other people's shoes, really listening to and understanding and, and feeling what they're feeling. And as leaders, it's also about taking actions to help address the challenges and the struggles or whatever may be causing some of the challenges. So I think it's a two-part equation of empathy. It's listening and it's also action. Excellent. Well, thank you, Susan and Andy and Z. A really engaging conversation. I've got pages of notes here to, to reflect on. And uh, by the way, we want to give a shout out to our wonderful sponsor. You know, this is the Vantage Point of View from the Top series of webinars, but it's brought to you by Vantage Circle. And, uh, you know, you can get uh, credits, uh, SHRM credits, if you go to the international marketing at vantagecircle.com. It's all at the bottom of the screen. And, you know, Andy, you brought up the idea, too, of being recognized and appreciated is an important part of an expression of empathy. And Vantage Circle actually has this, this free calculator called AIR that's available to everybody that you can sign up for as well if you want some more data to say, hey, are my recognition programs really working? Well, listen, from me and Adrian, thank you so much, Susan and Andy and Z, and for all of you that have, that have tuned in. This is such an important leadership skill that, you know, as Andy says, is, is tuning back into who you are. And as Susan said, that you also need to bring out in people and Z, make sure that your leaders are, are leading with that empathy. So, so much great information. Thank you so much for your time. We would always say, right, Adrian, have a great day and lead with more empathy. It's a better way to lead. It's a better way to live. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Guys.